<laughs> I'll hand you over to Dr. Briggs now. Thank you very much. So, um, good evening everyone and thank you Billy for the invitation to speak today. Um, as you said, we have tried to, to organise something a couple of years ago, but a lot has happened since then. Um, so I'm just really delighted that I'm able to come out for your, your first session together in two years. Um, so look, I have some slides that you're not really going to be able to see, um, so I'm just going to do just a little chat um, through them myself. They're, they're not very long, probably take about 10 minutes or so, and then maybe just kind of throw it out to the floor if there's anything that I can answer for you guys, um, if, if, that, if that form might suit you, okay? Um, so I do see a few familiar faces in the crowd, uh, many of you I, I haven't met before, so just want to introduce myself. Um, so Grace O'Carroll is my name, um, I am a Kerry native, so I'm, That's okay. <laughs> so I'm from Tralee. Um, born and bred there and did my medical training in UCC and my general medicine training and my cardiology training here in Ireland um, and then I travelled to London and I did some specialty training in heart failure and in cardiac transplantation so my kind of area of special interest would be managing heart failure um, but obviously uh, managing all cardiac conditions. Um, and then I returned from the UK in October 2019, so my first consultant post is here in UHK. Um, and I've just returned uh, from maternity leave at the start of October, so I'm just back into it uh, in the last couple of months uh, again. So, I suppose many of you obviously have, have used the service in UHK, but I just thought it would be good to outline as well as what or where we are currently with it and, and what developments may have happened in the last couple of years and I suppose what I would envisage the future of the service being going forward. So I suppose looking first at the staff that work in the hospital. Um, so at the moment there is myself as a consultant cardiologist and there has recently been the appointment of a second permanent position, which is wonderful um, because the hospital, I suppose, up until 2019 really just had sort of 0.5 of a cardiologist, which was quite low for the, the catchment area of Kerry. So it's really wonderful that kind of consultant cover for Kerry has increased um, and that cardiologist will be joining later in 2022, which will really expand the, the service, I think. Um, all of you really know, know Kay, so Kay is the uh, cardiac rehab nurse, um, specialist nurse in the hospital for, is it 30 years or so, Kay? <laughs> um, but uh, Kay has run obviously a wonderful cardiac rehab uh, service which many of you will, will have gone through um, and she is certainly the backbone of the entire service and has brought it to, to really what it is today um, so we have to commend her for that. Um, then there is another cardiac nurse who uh, many of you will have met, Kay Hayes, so she would work with me uh, predominantly in the wards so uh, when we do our inpatient consultation um, Kay would be, be part of the ward around for that and would be heavily involved in both cardiac rehab and in educating uh, patients uh, post sort of cardiac events, um, often post uh, as well as MIs or, or heart attacks or um, heart failure presentations. So she's got a really prominent role in our service as well. Um, what would be a newer development since I came to the hospital would be the development of a heart failure service. Now it really is in its infancy, um, but I suppose to date what we've gotten for the hospital is 1.5 uh, heart failure nurses, so that would involve um, two days a week, a week um, a nurse would come and do outpatient clinics with heart failure patients um, and then we have a, a five days a week inpatient uh, review from another uh, specialist nurse who took up the position just this year. Um, and then from a clerical officer point of view there's 1.5 uh, clerical officers working in the department and we have two healthcare assistants so they will be involved in um, performing ECGs and if any of you come in for water monitoring or blood pressure monitoring, the healthcare assistants will be involved with, with helping with, with, with that. Um, so that's the kind of the staffing level that we have at the moment. Um, I suppose I wanted to go through you know, what services we offer. Again, many of you have gone through the hospital so you're very aware of, of what's there. But I thought we could just outline specifically what we have and then I suppose what we're hoping to have in the future. So from an outpatient clinic point of view, I would run two general cardiology clinics per week and additionally I do a third clinic on a Friday afternoon targeting specifically heart failure, um, which would be a smaller clinic that I, that I just run generally on my own. 
Um, but that would be the kind of outpatient service that we provide. With regard to inpatient service, um, at the moment that's a consultation service, so if anyone is admitted to hospital with a cardiac condition, they're not admitted under me. They would be admitted under one of the medical physicians of the hospital who would then ask me to perform a consultation on that patient. And what I really hope over time is that, you know, as our team builds, as we get more hospital doctors that could work in cardiology and more nurses, that eventually we can have an inpatient cardiology service where all cardiac patients would actually be admitted under the cardiologist. Then with regard to procedures, um, so there will be three main types of procedures that we perform in the hospital. Um, so again, some of you may or may not be familiar with these, may have had some of them performed. Uh, but one would be cardioversion, which would be an electrical therapy that we can perform um, for irregular heartbeats. And the second would be transesophageal echocardiography, so that's called TOE, and that's a specific type of echo um, which I would perform about once a week. Uh, we have a list for that. Um, and a third procedure is something called the loop recorder insertion. So a loop recorder is a little device that can be placed under your skin if you require monitoring of your heartbeat, um, and this is a monitor that can as will stay until the battery runs out and, and can last about two years in a patient. So you can often get a much better yield than the Holter monitors, which are the monitors that we put on for maybe 24 or 48 hours, um, which can only capture your heartbeat, obviously, with that period of time. So we started to put loop recorders in uh, to patients in UHK also. And then our diagnostics department, um, where you would go for your testing. So I suppose the main diagnostics that we would perform would be the ECG, which would be your, your general heart tracing. Um, we perform echocardiograms, which would be the ultrasound scans that you can get of your heart. Uh, blood pressure monitoring, Holter monitoring, which is the recording of your heartbeat. Um, and also there's a pacemaker clinic. So for anybody that has any sort of pacemaker device or defibrillator device, there's a specific clinic with a physiologist who can follow up those devices and carry. And then for I suppose onward referral for more invasive procedures, we would be linked with two hospitals. So primarily we're linked with uh, Cork University Hospital. So this is where the angiogram referrals would, would go and also for patients who would need pacemakers inserted, that this would be the, the general route uh, for that. Um, we are also linked with University Hospital Limerick and that's specifically for what's called the Acute Coronary Syndrome Programme. So that's the national programme uh, where if somebody presents with a, a, a heart attack of a very specific kind that needs to very urgently go to a cath lab, we're actually I suppose, closer to UHL in Limerick than we are to CUH, so an ambulance will bring you directly to Limerick uh, to have an emergency procedure done there, um, with a transfer then back to, to UHK usually within 24 hours of that procedure. So there's a really good working relationship with both sites really, um, but as I say, predominantly it's uh, Cork University Hospital that, that our hospital will, will be linked to. Um, so I, I thought we might talk a little bit about you know, what developments have occurred over the last couple of years in the hospital. So uh, one of the, the biggest things that has happened is a new dedicated unit, um, which is purpose built for cardiology, opened in December, I think it's okay, December of um, last year. Um, and this is a really wonderful development for the hospital because I suppose when cardiology first took off, um, there was no real dedicated site for any of these diagnostics to be performed. So often, you know, if you needed to come in for an echo, it was just about trying to find any sort of outpatient room to bring a patient and to bring a machine to do that test. And, you know, roll on 25 years, we now have a dedicated suite which has, you know, two echo rooms specifically for echo, it has a, a room for your pacing checks, it has a room for your stress testing. Um, so I think it's just a wonderful new development for patients. It's just so much nicer than, I suppose, the previous site uh, that was being used. And certainly is, is a better, I think, patient experience and staff experience, you know, to, to have a unit like that. Um, so that's probably one of the biggest um, developments over the last 12 months. Um, as I alluded before, I suppose the other big development is that there will now be two permanent cardiologists in the hospital, so we would hope that that would dramatically improve the, the waiting list, which is very long, unfortunately, to, to get to, to my clinic at the moment. Um, but 
you know, with when the second cardiologist comes, that will naturally have that waiting list. Um, and then over time, hopefully, we can expand the service to include non-consultant hospital doctors or junior doctors, as you may know them. Um, and the more doctors that we can get into clinic, the shorter that waiting list will come. So it's just something that, that we're continuing to, to strive and, and work at uh, from our point of view to, to, to improve for everybody. Um, I think one of the major developments I think that the, the service needs is the expansion of nursing. Um, even more so than, than junior doctors. I think nursing needs to expand in a few areas. So obviously the cardiac rehab is a wonderful part of the service. Heart failure is beginning to evolve. Um, but for example, for the Catherine Terry that we have of 150,000, there should be a minimum of four uh, heart failure specialist nurses and even a heart failure was called an A&P, which is an advanced nurse practitioner who would uh, independently work really. So that would be five nurses that, that you would need for our catchment area at a minimum to provide a good heart failure service. Um, so we have you know, we've, we've one which is HSC funded and we have another which is drug company funded which is helping our service at the moment but expanding that in the future is one of my big aims. Um, and not just for heart failure so I think two other areas that really need expansion is chest pain because chest pain is one of the most common presentations to the emergency department. Um, and also arrhythmia or abnormal heart rhythms. So these would be, I suppose, the three conditions that I see every week so commonly. And if there were specialist nurses that, you know, a, a patient could enter that pathway to meet a specialist nurse in a prompt way, it, it will no doubt avoid A&E attendances and improve kind of the flow of a patient in the hospital as well. So I think that's probably the biggest task I have in my hands is you know, with, with the help of people like Hay and others, is, is to really push the nursing side so much. Um, and another development coming down the line is with our coronary care unit. So there is a coronary care unit in the hospital um, for a, a long number of years. Um, and the idea of a coronary care unit is that it will house uh, cardiac patients with specific conditions, particularly patients who are, have had a heart attack, um, who have problems with their heart rhythm that require intense monitoring or for patients that need specific type of intravenous cardiac medications that are not given on a general ward. So coronary care units are, are a very you know, vital part of hospitals for, for looking after cardiac patients. But certainly over the last number of years in UHK, the coronary care unit has sort of been used in a, in a different way because of, of the lack of governance of the cardiologists in the hospital. So it was really used as what's called a high dependency unit, which would mean that all types of, of unwell patients would enter there. So a sick surgical patient, um, a sick uh, gynecological patient, any type I suppose could enter that unit. Um, but I suppose the aim over time is to, to, to kind of get that back to being more of a cardiac unit um, and by providing sort of governance from the cardiologist's point of view, which really hasn't existed before. So that's something that, that um, I think over time is going to, to really improve um, as well as care of cardiac patients as inpatients because there'll be a more streamlined way into that, that unit for cardiac patients. Um, and then this is my last slide. So it, I suppose I just, in this went through, you know, what I see for the future of UHK. Obviously, there's another cardiologist joining me next year as well. So, you know, when she comes, um, I think it'll just allow a huge amount, amount of work to, to kind of go forward and and, uh, and push things over the line for the hospital. So, one, obviously, with my subspecialty training in heart failure, the heart failure service is is one of the biggest aims for me. It is a HSE clinical program, so there's two clinical programs for cardiology that the HSE run. So one is the acute coronary syndrome, which operates really well within Kerry. Um, as I said, you know you, you link to, to Limerick Hospital um, through the ambulance service if you have a, a heart attack that requires urgent treatment, um, and it just flows really well if you look at the key performance indicators of the hospital, which would mean you know are we meeting targets well for patients who present with heart attacks? The answer is yes. So the data would say everyone gets to where they should on time. They get the right treatment. They do well. You know, almost everybody makes it to cardiac rehab. Everybody is commenced on the right drugs. So that program does work really well, but the heart failure program does not, um, because it's never been implemented in the hospital. So I think it's it's no matter what cardiac condition somebody may have, 
towards the end of, of, of that, be it valve disease, be it a rhythm problem, heart failure is a condition where the heart is just being inefficient and, and can result in breathlessness and in fluid retention and that can be the common kind of final thing to happen with any cardiac condition so there's no doubt we need to further the heart failure service in the hospital. Um, another development coming to Kerry is something called a community hub. Um, so this is, is a very new concept. Um, many of you have probably heard of Slaunter Care on the news. Um, I, I certainly have. <laughs> and Slaunter Care, I suppose, is, is a kind of cross-party agreement of how the healthcare service should be run over sort of a 10-year period. And within that, Slaunter Care really highlights that we should be trying to do a lot of community-based care rather than constantly bringing patients into a hospital environment. So community hubs are being developed with the aim of looking after cardiovascular disease, diabetes and respiratory disease largely in the community. Um, and there's going to be a hub coming to Kerry, um, which is absolutely wonderful. And I think what would be different to, to, to having to come to hospital is that a GP will actually have direct access to a community hub to get a diagnostic done, so for example if somebody needed an echo or if somebody needed a consultation with a nurse specialist in diabetes or in cardiac conditions, that there'd be something in the community that was much more accessible than long hospital waiting lists. So that is definitely coming to Kerry. Um, Kerry is in the second phase of that rollout, so they're beginning with um, I think there's maybe 20, 28 or so, um, they're starting with maybe 18 uh, this year. So for example, Cork has two hubs that, that are, are nearly open. Um, so Kerry's probably a year away from having that hub operational, but it's just something to kind of be aware of and, and the GPs um, are going to absolutely love it because it will be a much kind of easier access to diagnostics and then to kind of onward opinion. Um, as you know, a lot of you probably know if you go to a GP now, you have to be referred into a hospital consultant. If you're referring to a hospital consultant with a long waiting list, you just wait an awful long time to possibly get your diagnostic as well. So I think this is really going to help with that. Um, I suppose other things I have here, staff expansion, I've kind of discussed that already, particularly nursing staff, um, of course, would be with that there's a requirement to increase all staffing levels with the, I suppose, the volume of work that we hope to be able to perform. So that will include clerical officers, that will include cardiac physiologists who will perform the diagnostic tests um, and then non-consulted hospital doctors. So again, it's, it's, it's probably more of a five year and a 10 year plan for the service to, to be expanding it to that degree, but it's certainly what we're going to be looking to do. Um, and again, uh, another important role I think that cardiology needs to play in the county is education. So UHK is a site for medical students, um, it's a site for nursing students, and it's a site for GP trainees. So it's a really good opportunity for us in cardiology to get involved in medical education, um, and even at GP level, so I suppose before COVID hit, um, you know, I was asked uh, on several occasions to go out to GP practices to give some teaching sessions. Um, I've gone up to the IT to the GP training uh, scheme and, and given sessions there as well. So I think just kind of expanding that role of cardiology will be really important um, going forward too. So I think I'll maybe leave it at that. Um, you know, I've been talking <laughs> quite a bit. Um, so again, thank you, thanks to, to Billy for inviting me and you know, I'll open it to the floor I suppose if there's anyone that would like to ask me any questions or was there anything I said that, that wasn't clear to anybody, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, please. Um, the hub that you mentioned about, yeah. would, it be, would it be like an equivalent of like another medical clinic, is that what you mean? Yeah, so uh, the idea of them is that there would be a GP lead and that there would be a public health nurse lead um, who would sort of be able to funnel patients that would require a diagnostic predominantly. So obviously I'm talking more cardiac wise here but th there are two other areas so diabetes and respiratory. So the idea is that a hub would be like a medical centre, be a physical medical centre that will not be in the hospital. I don't know where it will be yet, it, may, it, it probably won't be in Trinity, the idea would be probably to try and separate it from the hospital a little bit, so it could be in another town in Kerry. Um, and that there, there would be you know, physiologists who could perform echo, 
for example, for uh, respiratory patients, for lung function tests, there would be physiologists that could perform tests like that, and that there would be specialist nurses. So the idea is that the hubs would have a lot of specialist nurses for these conditions who would uh, operate independently and then when needed, seek advice from the hospital consultant or from the GP for sort of onward care. Um, but a lot of it, you know, so a lot of what GPs do require is rule out tests rather than rule in and I would see that in a lot of the referrals I get you know please see this lady she has a murmur you know nine out of ten murmurs end up not being anything significant so if there was a, a clearer path to get a diagnostic and get an echo that just showed there was no problem it would mean you never would have had to, to hit the doors of the hospital or go into a waiting list that was that long to come see a cardiologist that you probably didn't ever need to see because actually your test is normal. So it's kind of trying to, to, to look at that. Um, and then prevention is, is another, I suppose, key aspect. So it's, it's to, I suppose, GPs would, would obviously manage a lot of cardiac conditions like hypertension, high cholesterol, but it's to give a streamlined way for the GP to access the cardiologist for advice, you know, if they're not getting on top of the blood pressure well, if they're not getting on top of the cholesterol treatment uh, adequately, <coughs> You know, just an easy way for them to communicate with us and link with the hospital in an easy way rather than again perhaps writing a letter in that could take three months to get a response back from, you know. So I think it will streamline things, but you know, to answer your question, it will be a physical medical centre, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, do you have to have an appointment for going there? Do you have to go a GP appointment? Yeah, it would. It would be through the GP. Um, I'd have the ability to, to, to refer a patient. From the hospital too, if they required that hope, but it would be through your GP. Yeah. Actually, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Could you please explain what's involved in the procedure echocardiogram? Absolutely. Yeah. So, echocardiogram is an ultrasound. So, an ultrasound is a very simple um, test that allows us to take pictures of our organs. And it doesn't use radiation. So if you think of X-ray, like a chest X-ray, you're exposed to radiation for that. Um, but with ultrasound, it's basically sound waves are, there's a probe about maybe half the size of, of this microphone, and it's placed on the area that needs to be ultrasounded. So if you needed an ultrasound of your heart, we call it an echocardiogram. If you need an ultrasound of your leg, it's called an ultrasound of your leg, much more simpler. Um, so you can ultrasound many parts of the body. So with it, a little bit of jelly is basically put on the top of a probe like this, and the jelly then is placed to the area that you need to, to ultrasound. And then these sound waves are basically uh, sent into the body, and they hit off whatever it is you want to, to look at. So they can hit off bone, they can hit off of your heart muscle, and basically they send sound waves back out that the probe can pick up, and the probe is really clever and can turn it into pictures, <laughs> pretty much. So it's, it's really easy from a patient perspective, it's not painful, it's not invasive. Um, an echo would take about 20 minutes to be scanned. Um, I suppose you do have to be mobile enough in that we do kind of need you to sometimes move onto your side or, or move position to get a, a picture if, if it's difficult to, to achieve. And sometimes you might be asked to hold your breath um, for a short period, but it's, it's a really quite a, a simple uh, test to go through as a, as a, a patient, you know, uh, compared mm -hmm. to some of the other things we do. Mm -hmm. The first time I heard silence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you guys are supposed to be great with questions. I'm sorry, I have another one now. Sure. If, um, in relation to high cholesterol, mm -hmm. sometimes that like runs in families. Yes. Is it a, is it a very strong key marker of our, like, of our heart condition if the other markers are good, like if you're like on your weight and on mm -hmm. smoke and on drink a good diet, where does the cholesterol fit in there? So that, that's a really good question. Um, so it is generally, it is quite familiar, you can see that. Um, mm -hmm. Cholesterol is very genetically determined, that's the first thing I would say. So a lot of people would, would feel they don't maybe want to take treatment for it. You know, if I change my diet, if I lose weight, if I exercise, what you'll find is those are all obviously key things to do 
for your health in general. Um, but that will only maybe bring a reduction of maybe 10 to 15% of your cholesterol. So if we're aiming to get your cholesterol halved or even more, medication is, is definitely what's going to be needed. And that's because it is so genetically predetermined. It's not that your diet is causing this to be so bad. It's not that you're not exercising. Um, so yeah, absolutely, it runs in families. There's very specific types of um, high cholesterol that are rare, but they can be sort of inherited, I suppose, in, you know, I suppose a one in two chance. We, we call it autosomal dominant inheritance. Now, sorry, it's a bit technical, but it's, it's where, I suppose, your parents could pass on the gene that would give you high cholesterol, a sort of one in two chance of having a really, really high cholesterol that needs to be, you know, very much treated. That type of condition has very high cardiac risk because the cholesterol is so high and it is a marker of kind of very significant risk. That is really rare. So what's much more common is that you tend, you know, you might get high cholesterol in your 20s or 30s. Everything else is pretty normal. You may have a healthy weight, you may exercise, you don't smoke. And actually we often won't even treat that high cholesterol unless you develop, I suppose, other risk factors that would overall in increase your risk. A lot of GPs would use risk calculators, so there's something called a Q-score, there's, there's other type of scoring mechanisms where you look at a person and you look at you know, what age are they, what weight are they, what is their cholesterol, blood test level, do they have any history of vascular disease um, in, their, in their past, is there a family history, you know, their body mass index, so you, know, you can look at many factors to look at overall risk. So cholesterol alone is not to be treated unless you look at the overall picture of somebody. What I would say is when you hit your 40s age group and certainly your 50s age group, this is the age that uh, I suppose stroke disease and heart disease starts to become more apparent and certainly if you hit your 50s I would advocate treating high cholesterol to be honest. Not everyone may share that opinion, but uh, that, that would certainly be mine. I think it's the age that you really do start to see vascular disease developing. Um, and there's no doubt that cholesterol lowering therapies really minimise risk. The other thing to say is if you've had a cardiac event, so if you've had a heart attack and you've had to have treatment for that, regardless of your cholesterol blood test, if you're, even if your cholesterol blood test is really normal, you need to be on what's called statin therapy. So statin therapy has been shown that even regardless of your circulating cholesterol levels, that if you try and minimise it as much as possible with statins, your risk of having another cardiac event is really dramatically <coughs> reduced. Um, so a lot of people may feel, oh look, I've had an event, but actually my cholesterol is only three and my bad cholesterol is only 1.5. That's really good, you know, this is a really good number. Actually, the evidence would say that despite that, you still had an event, which means that some form of plaque or cholesterol got stuck to your artery and caused you to have that cardiac event. So you should be on a therapy to minimise the risk of it recurring. Thank you very much. Sorry, what, what would you consider to be high cholesterol? Or does it depend yeah, on the so person? It, again, it does depend on the person. So if, if, if you want a kind of a, a black and white answer, you would yeah. say, look, a total cholesterol being more than five, and we look at something called LDL, which is your bad cholesterol, so if that was above 3.3. But for example, if you have had a cardiac event, so if you've had a heart attack in the, in the past, the guidelines would be to get that LDL as close to 1.4 or under as possible. Okay, so that's half of the normal range. So, you know, you have to look at every individual. It can be really hard to achieve a target like that. It's a really, really low level. Um, and not everyone will reach that target, but that's the aim. So, but again, you know, if I suppose if you look at a healthy individual who's got a good weight, a normal blood pressure, is exercising, is not drinking too much alcohol, and is not smoking, you know, aiming for your total cholesterol to be five or under would be what you're aiming for, and the LDL about three point three. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask a question? Uh, uh, I was just reading last night actually about. A statin. Mm -hmm. a statin and some heart medication are not compatible. Mm -hmm. Whether it's true to that or not, I don't know, but I just I'm asking the question. Is, yeah. Is there, is so there so statins Yeah, no statins <coughs> definitely can get a bit of a bad reputation, um, which is unfortunate because they're such a wonderful a wonderful medication, but 
they, I suppose, act on our liver. So all drugs will act, I suppose, in the body and then get eliminated from the body either through our liver or through our kidneys. So often statins, you'll see if you read the inside of a box, will warn you about interactions with other drugs because statins are hugely sort of excreted or gotten rid of from the body and the liver. So if there's another drug that does the same thing, there's a potential risk that maybe one drug might allow another drug's amount in the body to be higher than it should be. So I don't know specifically, I suppose, what, what other, the other drug you were reading about was. Uh, I don't know, I'm not sure if I have the right. Clopidogrel? Yeah, so, so again, clopidogrel is a blood thinner that would be used if you have had a cardiac event, if you've had stenting. So there's absolutely no problem taking a statin with clopidogrel. But the reason that you may have read that might be something to do with, with, with liver. That's the most common thing that, that crops up with, with statins. It's really uncommon for a statin to cause a liver problem. And generally, what we would do is when somebody's on a statin, we'd recommend that you have liver function blood tests performed about six weeks later just to check that your liver function tests haven't risen up because of the drug. Um, and even if they have, you, I suppose we, we don't even get worried about that unless the liver blood tests have gone three times higher than they should be. So if they rise up a little bit, that's not of concern at all. Um, but yeah, it's a really common combination to have clipidogrel and good statins. So um, you, I suppose you've got to be careful where you read things, you know, what the source is and what who's writing it as well. Um, uh, but absolutely no problem taking staff with, with that drug. Thank you, thank yeah. you very much. Can I ask another question? Is there, can, is yeah. there a connection between diabetes and cardiac events? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess it's cardiovascular disease is the commonest. Um, disease that a diabetic will develop in their lifetime and it is the commonest reason for mortality or death in someone who has diabetes. It's actually the commonest reason for any of us to die is from cardiac disease in Ireland. So every year there's about 9,000 people who would die from cardiac disease, a similar number to cancer um, and then the other third is, is kind of miscellaneous. So it's just so common, cardiovascular disease in general. Um, and if you have diabetes, your risk of it is really significantly increased if your diabetes is not treated. Um, so there's a huge amount of studies done on every diabetic drug, um, I suppose dating back to the 90s and, and beyond. And you can see that if you get your sugar control under control, uh, if your sugars are good, um, and there's a marker called your HbA1c, which is a marker of your kind of general sugar control over a two month period. If you can get that blood test to show that your sugar control has been very good, then you can really, really minimize your risk of cardiac disease. Now it's not down to zero, but what you can do is you can bring it down to a level which is similar to someone who doesn't have diabetes. So it's not going to be exactly the same risk as that person, but you're going to bring it really close to that person. But if you don't treat the diabetes well, um, which unfortunately is the case in, in, for some people, and, and through no fault of, of anyone, sometimes diabetes is really hard to control. You may require insulin. Um, so it, it, it's not a simple disease but by any uh, means, but um, I think getting it as under control as possible will definitely bring your risk down. But I suppose strokes, and heart disease and heart failure and um, heart attacks would be the commonest presentations that diabetics would have. Um, I suppose the other big thing would be what's called microvascular events. So that would be more to do with the very small blood vessels in our body you can get damaged by diabetes. And these very small blood vessels, particularly in our kidneys um, and in our brain, can get affected. So that again could affect your kidney function over time, can affect your cognition and your brain function over time as well. Um, and that's the kind of lesser seen thing. You know, it's very obvious if somebody has a stroke, it's very obvious if somebody comes in with a heart attack, but there's a lot of what's called microvascular disease that happens as well with, with diabetes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. If you get um, pain, and uh, it's one of those ones you don't know whether <laughs> something as bad as that really happening, but it's bad enough for you to be concerned. Mm -hmm. Are you better off just bringing an ambulance now than phoning your doctor or trying to get a call through to the doctor? Yeah, I think calling ambulance. Do you recommend ambulance, ambulance to mm -hmm. 
trying to get through? I think so, yes. Um, I think there's, there's a variety of scenarios that can crop up like that. Um, some people <laughs> who have you know, a history of angina and they know what that feels like, they'll know if they're getting the symptom that they're used to or not. And they'll know if, if this is actually quite serious because it's not responding to the spray I usually take under my tongue um, or I've taken my spray twice and it really has made no difference. You know, scenarios like that, you have to act quickly and I think calling an ambulance is much safer than you or a relative trying to drive you to a hospital because if something sudden happened en route, you, you leave yourself, not everyone's going to have one of these obviously uh, with them and you know, I think an ambulance is, is always a safer call. Now that being said, I know that you know you don't want to be every if you get a pain every month. You don't want to be constantly calling for help. But I can see that there is, you know, there's a balance, there's a balance to be had. Um, but you have to use common sense. And I think if something is severe, if it's sudden, and if it worries you, no one's ever going to to be bothered that you call an ambulance to, to get yourself seen. Um, we certainly want to see you in hospital. We can't tell over the phone, and neither can a GP. To be honest, you know. Um, whether you have a cardiac history or not, whether you have no risk factors or you have 10 risk factors, nobody can tell you over the phone that that's not a cardiac event, mm -hmm. you know. And what can be difficult is, you know, bed at night time would be a common time that a symptom happens for people, um, and reflux disease, which would be when you can get acid reflux from your stomach oh, that can yes. go up into your esophagus yeah. and it can cause your esophagus to spasm, they can feel very similar. Um, and we, can, we can't tell what that is unless you actually come in, have your ECG and have your blood test taken to be sure that you haven't had a cardiac event. Yes. Um, so again, a lot of people do wake up from sleep and I would say don't ignore it and you should yeah. call for help to come in. Sorry, do you take five patients in or do you just go ahead and I don't, no, not at the moment. The, the public clinic is so... Um, so Lot, the waiting list is so long for it, I guess, that my, I, I'm trying to do three clinics a week it, it, with the public service at the moment, so I'm not doing private uh, work. Yeah. Okay. And the person wants to go, like, I mean, if I was a private patient and they want to go public to you, I would. You can, you okay. can, absolutely, yeah. Um, so it just takes a GP referral uh, into the hospital. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, yeah, you're right, because they, they send in a lot of templates that they would I suppose, print off from, from the programme that they use in the GP practice, and they, within that they can write exactly you know, what you discussed in the consultation, but some of them will literally just say, please see Mary for a murmur, and nothing else. So again, like to, so I, it's called triaging, where I look through letters uh, on a weekly basis, on a daily basis really, and, and go through what the referrals are, do I deem it to be clinically urgent or clinically routine, and then you enter a different pathway based on, on that. So the referral is quite important um, to really outline, you know, you know if, if something sounds very urgent or, or if, if, if your GP and you feel that it really needs to be urgently seen, that should be written down because, of course, I listen to that and I'll treat it accordingly. But yeah, I guess one-liners are, are very easy to put into a routine list because I suppose if you see a letter hasn't got much information in it, you kind of make an assumption that nobody's too worried about it because they haven't sort of highlighted anything very significant to me. Um, so yeah, I guess that, that is an important point to make, yeah. And there is a big difference in the waiting list, so for example, it's over three years at the moment to get a routine appointment, and it's seven months for an urgent appointment. So I hate saying that, it's, it's a horrible figure to, to have to, to say to you, um, but that's what the waiting times are at the moment. Um, but, you know, there, there's cause for optimism, obviously, the, uh, the coming of second cardiologist very soon will make that list much, much better. Um, and I just have to keep pushing to get non-consultant hospital doctors into the clinic too. Um, so lots of work to be done there. Please just one other quick, one other quick question. Yeah. Is there a, a time or an age when people should be on aspirin? 
So the short answer is no. <laughs> um, I would find that a lot of um, people might come to my clinic and I'd ask them, yeah, how long, you know, why are you on aspirin? Like, what's the indication for it? And they wouldn't know. <coughs> so that you'd have had no vascular event. That's generally why someone would need to be on aspirin. It's a blood thinner. Um, and the idea of it is that it can help, um, often with other drugs like statins, it can help prevent plaque, which would be sort of bits of our blood plus cholesterol sort of sticking to the lining of our arteries. And it can really help prevent that um, from happening. But if you use it in younger people in particular, you're not at risk of that anyway. Um, so you're potentially just exposing somebody to the risk of a blood thinner without actually any added benefit to their overall vascular risk. You would see a lot of GPs would tend to use it in a patient who has diabetes because of the known increased vascular risk. And I think that's quite a reasonable thing to do. Um, but there's no big trials that say, yes, that, you know, at age 55, everyone should go on aspirin because you have a reduction in, in risk. You know, there, there's no trial that will tell us that. So a lot of people, a lot of GPs are kind of trying to use their common sense, looking at the risk factor profile of somebody and making that call. Um, but I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't tend to, to start anybody on aspirin unless they had a kind of confirmed vascular disease of some kind that needed the treatment really. Oh. Yeah. Because aspirin, although, I mean, the dose of it is, is quite low. So, for example, if you were to take aspirin for a headache, you could take 300 milligrams of it, whereas the dose that we use for cardiac conditions would be 75 milligrams. So it's quite a low daily dose of aspirin. But over time, aspirin could cause stomach irritation. You know, very rarely it may cause bleeding in the stomach. So, again, you'd want to know, you know, what's the indication for taking it. No, uh, one or two that I know that actually took aspirin on the understanding that they'll save mm -hmm. that to keep their blood in for years. Yeah, I think that that's kind of coming back to your point is, and a lot of GPs would practice that actually. Um, it's sort of a historical practice that doesn't have a huge amount of, of weight to it. To be honest, if you look at, at kind of the trials and the evidence, which is how we practice medicine, you know, you need to say look we're doing this because we've looked at it in thousands of people and we can see that you know if you take aspirin it will reduce a b or c so we don't have trials that say that um, but uh, the, the practice for many decades has been to give people aspirin if they perhaps re reach a certain age you could pick age 50 you could pick age 60 because in those age groups vascular disease is just more common you're more likely to have a stroke as you get older you're more likely to have um, vascular disease of your heart arteries if you get older. So that's kind of the, the rationale that a lot of, of, of people would use. So people would tend to maybe do it themselves and, and some GPs would, would prescribe it. But there's no huge evidence for doing it, to be honest. I, mean, I certainly don't do it in, in my practice. Yeah. yeah. But if this is not recommended by the doctor, that they take it on themselves just to find their name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but as with anything, not just with aspirin, but... Pardon? Are they doing good thing or bad thing by, by taking it on themselves? They're probably not doing anything particularly good or bad, you know, so the evidence wouldn't support that it's beneficial, yeah. nor would it support that you're putting yourself at major risk. So aspirin is, is you know, a, a very safe drug generally. Now, again, if you were taking aspirin unnecessarily, but you were also taking other drugs that increased your bleeding risk, then that would be a, a wrong combination, to be honest. So you kind of have to look at it, every individual, you know, um, yeah. or if you had a history of peptic ulcer disease, you know, if you had ulcers in your tummy, mm -hmm. and you had a history of that, and you took aspirin unnecessarily, you may increase your risk of having a bleed from that ulcer, which was an unnecessary risk to take, because actually you didn't have any vascular disease to be treating, you know. So, so as everyone is an individual, you have to, to look at that, but, um, and I suppose aspirin is available over the counter, so it does not have to be prescribed, obviously, <coughs> by, by a GP or by, <coughs> by a doctor. Well, uh, it has been stated that aspirin can actually have an effect in the stomach, as you say, but um, if people are on the likes of Nexium, yeah. it prevents that to them. So we, yeah, we would commonly use a drug like Nexium, particularly um, if you're on more than one blood thinner, because there's no doubt if you're on two blood thinners, you are at increased risk of stomach irritation. 
um, and a common practice um, would be if you've had a stent in one of your coronary arteries yeah. is to be on a combination of two blood thinners for 12 months. So it would be very common that we prescribe something like Nexium to, to help to kind of reduce the acid yeah. secretion in your stomach and kind of reduce the risk of irritation. And, yeah. Okay, yeah. every question out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank you. Why don't we give it all the